mode. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Adam Harris, and I will be your uh, trader slash presenter slash speaker for this evening. So the first thing that I want to do is just check that the audio is good and that you can see my screen. So uh, from my side, I have green lights across the board and uh, the audio should all be very good and crisp and clear on your side. And you should see a slide up ahead, which is Capital Markets Elite Group live webinar. How will you handle the year end volatility? Um, so if all of that is good, uh, then that should be uh, working perfectly for you. And also this is being recorded. So I think it'll be up to um, Capital Markets to see if they're going to provide you with a copy of the recording, but it is being recorded just so that you know. Okay, so now that we have done that, I think we can just go through uh, the risk disclaimer. <clears throat> and uh, while you are uh, reading that, I'm going to give, well, I'm going to give you an opportunity to digest and process that. I will give you some background behind who I am. Uh, so I am a London, I'm based in London. I um, am both a day trader and uh, investor, meaning I usually day trade the UK session in the morning or the US session uh, as it opens. It's not a consistent, it's not an everyday thing. I have other tasks I have to do. Uh, and then I usually will look at the daily chart to look for any opportunities there. I'm very much focused on all different asset classes. I'm predominantly a technical trend trader. I also manage uh, my own stock portfolio and uh, family as well, a couple of family and uh, close friends manage stocks portfolio. And this is part of the reason I'm very excited to go through the markets with you tonight. We are in a bull market. I'm going to talk to you about how to identify amongst all the other things on the agenda. Let's move on to the agenda here. Amongst all the other things here, I'm going to have a look at some criteria to help determine whether we are in a bull market or bear market. So uh, on the agenda today, we're going to talk about how to conduct trend analysis to determine which assets offer the best risk reward propositions, how to use indicators such as the RSI, MACD, and stochastic oscillator to predict potential trends and reversals, Strategies for trading various assets across short, medium, and longer term timeframes, and then how to determine, it's quite a lot, sorry, this is quite a lot to squeeze into just 60 minutes. Um, and the fourth one being how to determine stop loss levels and uh, manage risk as well as protect against large drawdowns. Okay, so I think what I would like to do sort of before we kick off is cover a couple of conceptual differences here um, for the purposes of clarity. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the difference here between trading uh, versus investing, I beg your pardon. Let's clarify the differences there. Um, and so, broadly speaking, I'm just gonna I'm gonna generalize. I'm gonna keep it very simple, but there is a point here. So let's imagine, for the purposes of uh, discussion, that we're looking here at the S&P. So the S&P index, the Standard and Poor's 500 index, obviously uh, 500 serious companies that we know of in the US, that we know the brands globally. And imagine we're looking at a daily chart here so we can see that price goes up and down and up and down, ultimately goes up uh, towards the top, sort of right hand side of the screen. Now let's talk about investing. <clears throat> so very quickly, investing is a much more passive activity, all right? So it's very important with investing, we need time for the markets to bake. In order to get the results that we want, we need the markets to bake. Now. I, before I kind of go any further, I should let you know, tragically, Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's business partner for 50 years or something, has tragically passed away yesterday at the ripe old age of 99, so very good innings. But I imagine <clears throat> Warren Buffett must be absolutely distraught. I've been very much influenced by Warren Buffett and value investing. So although I am a technical trader and make a lot of my decisions based on the technicals, I have also been brought up as a value investor. So ideally what I look for is very good companies that are very stable, that have the characteristics that Buffett enjoys, but I then overlay technical analysis on top of that. And I'm gonna give you a good sense of that by the time we finish today's session. So investing is largely a passive activity. Let's imagine a scenario where a person has, um, somehow has you know, saved up 500, 5,000, 50,000 bucks, for example, and wants to do something with it. They don't wanna leave it in the bank account, earning uh, sort of, in their mind, very small interest. They want to invest it somewhere. So we've got a couple of choices. Historically, stocks and property are historically the oldest, most reliable ways for the average person to learn or sort of to increase their net worth. Um, 
whether you buy property and sell it, whether you buy property and rent it out, whether you buy a stock, exactly that same kind of thing. So here's what often happens, and I'm generalizing here, but it is generally true. The individual will identify where they want to put the money, they either give it to an investor or the bank advises them, put it with a BlackRock portfolio or an ETF or with ARK, or they decide to put it into a stock that they like. So maybe they love Tesla, maybe they love uh, Nvidia, maybe they love Bitcoin, so they decide to put it into the market. Now, usually what happens is the logic goes as follows. I'm not going to wait for it to necessarily get in at a good price because you'll notice that the market can go up or down. The logic, usually this is what happens. Person goes, look, the sooner I put this into the market, the sooner it can get to work for me. So often they're not really concerned about price. They'll just throw it into the market. The idea then is that they'll have to write out the good times, the bad times, the good times, the bad times, those periods of uncertainty, the periods of greed and fear, so on and so forth. But the idea is that over a long enough period of time, it should increase in value. Okay, it should increase in value. It's a it, it's a bake. It's baking should increase in value. And what's interesting about that is that that actually then automatically discounts certain asset classes. So asset classes would be something such as stocks or equities versus commodities versus currencies. Okay, versus cryptocurrencies. Those are different asset classes. So this would exclude currencies, for example, because currencies would have the euro against the US dollar or dollar against the yen or Swiss franc against the Japanese yen, for example. And that tends to be two economies against each other. It's very convoluted. You've actually got to deal with the supply and demand of one economy versus the supply and demand of another economy. So it's very complicated and they can go up or down. They tend to cycle over very long periods of time. So stocks are very popular because they tend to increase in value over time if we can identify stable, healthy, strong stocks. So here's what happens. It tends to be very passive. It's not something you have to do on a daily basis or uh, um, on a frequent basis every few hours, usually every few days. It's potentially every few months that you might be looking for opportunities to either get in and get out and then build up your portfolio. And then ideally leave the things that are performing really well, leave them in and then get rid of the weakest ones, cull the weakest ones, so to speak. So quite different when we then go across and have a look at investing. So this, the reason I'm talking about this is because these days not enough people are I feel this is something that should be covered in high school. In fact, this, these are skills that should be covered in high school. They're not, they're not, if they're done right, I don't think it's necessarily a dangerous activity. No more so than I think a professional sport is. You can still get injured, you can still do stuff, but it's always about proper training and proper caution and risk management and risk mitigation. So here we're gonna talk about trading. All right, so trading is a very different activity. Trading is when we are looking to actually earn a monthly income secondary or primary source of income from engaging in a financial market. So working backwards, if we want to get paid at the end of the month, we must have closed out our positions every month, which means that either every week we've got to be closing out positions, um, but certainly by the end of the month, there have to be enough, there has to be enough profit banks that we can then withdraw a paycheck and ideally leave some in and build up some savings and so on. So trading is much more shorter term. It's looking for an opportunity for the next few hours to the next few days potentially the next few weeks, but that's it. Pre predominantly the next few days, you want something to realize a profit. Um, and so what happens with trading, for example, is you'll be looking at shorter term, what are the existing trends here? It's an uptrend. I might spot a nice little retracement, a pullback, very nice bullish candle. Look to enter precisely above one pip or one point above the high of that candle and put my stop loss, for example, uh, precisely one point below the low of that candle and target three to one. So that's a traditional trend trading approach, looking to get in on a pullback or a breakout, and then looking to join that trend, targeting three to one and closing out positions as I go, maybe trailing my stop loss. But that's it. It is a fixed single move that I am expecting the market to make. If the market changes its trend and starts to look bearish, and I therefore have a nice little bearish setup here, I'm looking to enter one put below that, stop loss one put below that, targeting three to one, for example, ideally, and closing out that trade. So it's much more granular. It's going with the daily trend, for example, to the upside and to the downside. This can be known as swing trading, but day traders are also doing the same thing. It's very precise. You have an exact entry for where you get in and where you get out. You actually know predominantly where your exit points are going to be. If it goes against you, also if it goes in your favor. All right, so we trade both up and down. So a wider variety of that. What we're really looking for as traders is very high probability moves where we expect the market to do something. So let me give you an explanation for that. 
So it's a different, you're wearing a different hat. Your mindset is very different. You could still be in the same markets, still occupy, you know, engaging in the same asset classes, but your decision making processes and your selection processes are different and your timelines are different. It's kind of like having rugby on a field and soccer on a field or football that they're both played on a field, similar number of players on each side, different, slightly different shaped balls, different type, uh, different shaped goals. But they kind of, if you came from outer space, you would think they were maybe the same sport. They're kind of similar, but you couldn't. They play with fundamentally different rules. Give me one second, my office. I need to open the door for a second and just get a little bit of fresh air. It's very cold outside and the office is getting a bit uh, fusty, I guess is the word I would use. Okay, so, um, so this is really important because these are this changes the way we behave and it changes how we value whether something is worth our while or not. So let me give an example of what we mean as well when I talk about it being a single move thing. So let's just say that there is a key price level for gold at $1,900 and there's another key price historical level for gold at $2,000. Okay, so here we've got $2,000 per ounce and we've got $1,900 per ounce. And these price levels tend to be historic historically significant, we could see gold actually responds to that. This is just, it could be a stock, but I'm just gonna use gold in this example. So we noticed that the market has come up and tested this level, it's tried it again, and eventually it's broken through, it's come back and tested that same level as resistance, it's tested it as support. So now, what happens in these situations most of the time, this is generally the way the market flows, once it breaks through a significant price level, it tends to work its way to the next significant price level, the, that path of least resistance. So it's not unreasonable to assume that it's gonna work its way up to this level. So this is the next major significant level. And so we can see the market moves and pulls back and it extends and retraces and extends and retraces and extends and retraces. So we can see the rhythm, the waves of the buyers and sellers getting in and out of the market. Um, and one thing I should clear up here is that, you know, sometimes people think that, well, if the market's going up, everybody's a buyer because everyone can see it's going up. So why isn't everyone buying it? And if it's going down, everyone's a seller. But here's the thing. And the best analogy is also property. If, if there's a property market boom, there are lots of people who have owned a house for many years who've now decided it's worth their while to sell their house because it's worth way more than when they bought it. So they're selling even though the market is going up. And lots of people are buying because they're panicking. They think they're not going to get a chance to buy at a cheaper price. So they panic and they buy it. So you've got buyers in, an up, in, an, in a market boom, property market boom, and sellers in a property market boom. When the property market is crashing, you've got people who bought at the highs, for example, who are selling now because they're panicking, <clears throat> because they're terrified they're going to lose too much value on their property. And some people are afraid they were always intending to sell. And now they're worried they're not going to get as much money for it. So they're selling. The market's going down. That's fine. But then you've also got property investors who are looking to buy because now properties are becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So during a bear market or during a, a market crash, so to speak, property market crash, you've got buyers and sellers getting in and out for various reasons. So it's important to understand that when we see a market going up, there's always buyers and sellers getting in and out for their own personal reasons and their own personal logic. All right, despite the fact that the market is going up, there will be people on both sides of that field. So here's the thing. We see the market pulling back and pulling back and pulling back. And there's only two ways to get into a market. And it's only into a moving market. You either get in on a break of a new high or on a pullback. So when it pulls back, you either get in or as it breaks this high, that's your last opportunity to get in, which really means we're always looking to get in on the market on a pullback or a breakout. The problem is that most people are not confident in that decision. And so they wait and they wait. And they, so they get in on the second half of the move. And so they wait until it's too late. Okay, so we, it's the first bit of training you have to do when you learn how to trade uh, or invest technically is waiting for those pullbacks, which requires discipline. So that's why I was talking about it here. Most people often just don't have the time or the patience or the inclination to do it. So here's my point. We can see this repeated pattern at a very powerful trend. We can see the market pulling back here. We know that the next major level is up here. And what we are doing as traders is we have identified a very high probability setup here where the most likely thing this market is going to do next is go up. That is the most likely, but not guaranteed action, but very high probability. And actually there's as close to a sure thing as you can get. You don't, it's never hundred percent guaranteed, but it's as close to a sure thing as you can get. And so it's a very high probability setup. And so traders are really only looking to capture this move. They'll look to get in here and capture some profits, put their stop loss here or below this low or below this low and look to take profits ahead of that major level. And that's it. It's very high probability to their mind 
if they see a hundred setups like that, more, way more of those setups will make the money than will suddenly decide for some reason to go down here and then go back up. So it'll happen, but it's the, the there are certain setups where the probability of it just completing that next move is so good that it's ridiculous to not take that trade. But it's a short-term trade. We know that this is our end goal. Once it gets there, we'll have to reassess. Is it gonna then change trend and come back down to this level? Or is it gonna break through and then we look for continued buys? So traders are always waiting and they're looking really for what happens between those two key levels. So this is all, we'll all come together. It's a little bit of a wax on, wax off moment. Thank you for your patience and waiting with me. A little bit of a wax on, wax off moment. And I'm just trying to kind of put all of this together. So I really want to differentiate, <coughs> excuse me, differentiate between the between investing trading how the decision making process there will be things that overlap we're looking really for a quality trend that's a really big thing that i would add on top of all the things i like about warren buffett style but i would do that and when i say warren buffett i actually mean warren buffett and charlie munger together because they've really one in the same um and i've been influenced by uh, other people i would really highly recommend if you're very confused about what's going on in the world today i can't recommend enough ray dalio of bridgewater associates has done a series of books if you just YouTube the economic machine, there's an animation that comes up, but he's done the most amazing book called The New World Order, which is phenomenal, teaches you so much about ec economics and uh, governments in different countries. Incredible, incredible book. And the guy really knows this stuff. Okay, so that's trading versus investing. And now we can sort of go to the platform and have a look. I wanna just kind of revisit some of the items listed here. We're gonna talk about how to conduct trend analysis to determine this one. So believe it or not, I've already kind of touched on that a little bit. And we're gonna talk about indicators that are gonna help us. They're very powerful additional tools. Okay, and then, um, <coughs> excuse me. And then we have, uh, Okay, then we're going to talk about strategies, which I've kind of started to chip away at. And then we're going to talk a little bit about stop loss levels, which I've also kind of chipped away at. Like I said, it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a wax on, wax off moment. Okay, so um, let's go across to the platform. So this one I've uh, the way that I've done this is let's just go across here and have a look at this. Um, and so what I've got is I've added a few of the different instruments here. Now I, I could have sworn I had a full on watch list that was prepared and not able to find it at the moment. So I've started to build the watch list and what I really wanted to do. And if you want me to have a look at something, please feel free to put it into the questions box. But what I thought I would do is actually start to build up a bit of a portfolio and kind of take you through the reasoning um, behind this. So one of the things I've also done is just added in here a little bit of a site where you can then look for certain things. So if you're wanting to find the symbol of something such as Berkshire Hathaway, we've got BL key dot, uh, so the B, um, B class and A class, uh, for Berkshire Hathaway, so BRK, not BRK. Um, so we can go ahead here, and so let's go in and add in BRK. And then we've got the A and the B. So I'm just gonna go ahead with B. It's pretty much the same data, it doesn't really matter. I have both B and A um, in my portfolio, so not really worried about that. So the next thing that I wanna talk you through is kind of what we're looking at on the chart chart. I want you to imagine, bear with me, but I want you to imagine that the chart of a stock is very much its heartbeat. Very much its heartbeat. If I was, uh, and this is the beauty of, of a lot of people think that technical analysis and fundamental analysis are very different things. They're not really. They're actually looking at the data. It's two sides of the same coin. So it's looking at the same information, but with technical analysis, we plot the numbers and then look at what that tells us. So for example, let's imagine that I'm looking at a company, I'm looking at its, its performance over the last few years, I'm looking at its monthly profits, for example, not just assets and liabilities, you know, but what's, its kind of, what's on its balance sheet and what's its kind of profits on a monthly basis. And let's just say that it's consistently making it profits every single month, a little bit more each month, but it's very, very consistent. And the growth is consistent. If you asked me to guess hypothetically what the next month would be like, it would not be unreasonable for me to go well based off the last few years and its consistency in achieving these types of profits i would be surprised the odds are that the next month will also be consistently profitable and potentially a little bit more than the previous month because that is collectively its personality and its type of behavior so that's really what we do is, as technical traders and technical investors we're saying look if this is the heartbeat and this is the behavior it's not unreasonable to believe that it's going to continue to do that unless its behavior starts to change. And that can happen. If you get a change in management, 
you can suddenly see a company that doesn't really perform as well as it should. And let me give you an example. So I've actually got a couple here. So if I want to have a look at, just see if it brings up Estee Lauder here. So Estee Lauder, beautiful, love it, great. But look at this performance um, over kind of going back to sort of post COVID, it has given back a lot of its value. But prior to that, its performance was incredibly consistent, just so beautifully consistent. And so for me, yes, I would be looking at various, I'd love to know why that is, you know, is it, is it a change in management? Is it a change in products? What's the kind of thing I'd love to do that? But there's clearly something that is, you know, has managed to change in that respect. But then you can go ahead and you can have a look at say Netflix, for example. And you can see also very, very strong correction. However, this one has managed to recover, getting very much back up to the upside here. Okay. Um, and so, what we're doing in this exact moment is we're really looking at the candlesticks without everything else. I really am only focusing on the general flow of price. A lot of people can be intimidated by candlesticks or the price, the purest price. And so they often want to potentially put other things on top, indicators such as the MACD and RSI and stochastics and moving averages. But here's a little secret I'm gonna tell you. The information may appear visually more complicated, but it actually isn't, there isn't, it isn't more complicated. It's just the purest information on price. And it tells us so much about the price itself that we should always be looking at that first before we then look at the moving averages and look at any of the other indicators uh, that we've added. Now I have to go back and close the door because now the office has got too cold. So there we go. All right. So it's important that we are not intimidated by the candles or the line, whichever we choose to do, or if it's OHLC bars, so if we're looking for those, we really shouldn't be intimidated by any of that. It's, uh, it's not as complicated as it might seem. So we have a couple, what I've done in here is I've added in a series of moving averages. Now, the widest one, which is traditionally green is the 200 SMA, I've added in simple moving averages. So why have I done that? I've done that because here's the kind of logic. When you go back to the 70s and 80s, when it was really just predominantly the stock markets, currency markets were not available. They only became publicly available to retail traders or investors. And when I say traders, for the purposes of today's discussion, I mean trader slash investor, okay? Um, it wasn't really available. And so, believe it or not, um, investors, used to have to manually draw their moving averages every day that had to calculate it. And so simple moving averages was a, really a straightforward thing. You would take the closing, average closing price of the previous 20 candles, for example, and plot that, calculate it and plot it and join the dots. And you would plot your own 20 moving average or 50. And so the traditional ones were the 200, the 50 red in 50, the blue 20, and I've got here the 10 in white or light gray. You get others who talk about the eight and 21 and various other things. But actually, again, if our focus is purely on price action, uh, the rest of the moving averages don't, they don't, the important thing to understand about indicators is an indicator doesn't suddenly provide you with 100% of the insight that you weren't getting anywhere else. When we look at pure price action, we're getting about 80% of the information we need. We're then adding a few other indicators on top of that to, to almost confirm and to overlay and to help clarify what we're seeing to bring that 80% up to 90%, for example. So most people think that if I'm using a MACD and I'm using that as a strategy, that's 100% of my solution. There isn't anything that, that is a 100% solution or um, you know, the holy grail, that doesn't exist. But there are lots of ways in which we can use stuff that gets us close to that consistently. And it isn't like one thing is very different from another. All of them do generally the same thing. I'm gonna talk you through these as well. They do generally the same thing. So if we obsess about RSI over the MACD, we need to have data that really shows us that because for the most part, it doesn't really give us much difference. Okay, so here we have price generally climbing up. But if we just look at it now, it is very much in an uptrend, okay? It's beautiful. It's got a very nice rhythm of extension, retracement, extension, retracement. And I've got the 200 and the 50 and the 20 and the 10. Now, for the purposes of what we're talking about today, this section over here, I want you to have a look at this. This as a sample, of what I want to call thoroughbred performance. So imagine there's a period when the markets are happy and the individual stocks are happy. And then they tend to have a particular type of heartbeat. And this is what we're kind of looking at here. We'll see 
that the 200, the 50, the 20, and the 10 are all fanning out. When they're all fanning out, what does that mean? It means that the longer term, the medium term, and the shorter term trends are established. That's a good thing. It means it's calm, it's happy, it's on its way. All right. Now, from a broad perspective, we've heard, you may have heard of a death cross or a golden cross. That's when the 50 uh, crosses below the green, the 200. The 50 crosses below the 200. We call that the death cross. Uh, and if it crosses above it, we get what's called a golden cross. That's because, again, we have that because so, so many people are intimidated by price that it's easy to just talk about the moving average, which is a smoothed out version of the price. Basically, is telling you that the average price is now more bullish than bearish or is more bearish than bullish. Um, and that's not bad. You can use that as a broad categorization. You can broadly say the market is, but you shouldn't use it as a reason. This is very important, as a reason to buy or sell something. It's not enough. It's a, it's a, like a weather vane. It tells you which way the wind's blowing, but it isn't enough to say the price is good or bad. This is really where the 10 and 20 become incredibly powerful. The 10 and 20 and possibly the 50 become very, very, very powerful as precise locations for buying opportunities or selling opportunities if you're deciding to short a market. You'll notice if you think about it like a train station, okay, so this is the train, the train is heading away, comes back to the station, heads away, goes to the next station, heads away, goes to the next station, and we can see it consistently. If you put the 10 and 20 together, we can see that the price action, when it is trending, which is when you want to engage on it, will consistently and reliably return to the 10 and 20 moving averages, okay? And provide potentially some good opportunities to get in. So for me, again, that there's always that, the best time to get in on a move, and that means that I should always be looking to join a moving market from the location of the moving averages. If price is far away from the moving averages, that's the problem. That's where I'm getting in at the wrong time. And this is almost always where untrained individuals look to buy. They always, always buy at that because that's when you hear about it in the news. When it's gone and spiked, you hear in videos suddenly out of this area, suddenly everyone wants to buy, and it's far away from the moving averages. And that requires the very discipline and patience that Warren Buffett always talks about. And when I say Warren Buffett, I mean anyone like him cut from that same cloth. There's Peter Lynch, one up on Wall Street incredible book. You've got Joel Greenblatt, who's done uh, the little book of investing, also phenomenal stuff. If it's far away from the moving averages, and it always comes back, you, that's, it's too late. It's gone. The train has left the station. If you can take something away from that tonight, that's what I would recommend. So always looking to get involved in the moving averages. Now that I've kind of given you a broad idea of where, how we, you know, which of the different moving averages we use, but how powerful they can be, um, we can go ahead. So let's have a look at where we are now. Okay, so one of the things that I said I would do in this proprietary knowledge, this is my kind of stuff. I'm going to talk to you about generally speaking, generally whether we can identify whether a market is, whether we're in a bull market or a bear market. The media, first of all, is always going to be negative. It's always going to be negative and there's always a massive lag. It's usually when we start breaking to new highs that the media reluctantly says, okay, well, we're in a new bull market. And even so, even though the markets are doing incredibly well at the moment, I'm, I can see stuff coming out on, online that says this hedge fund or this institution predicts that we will have a recession 2024. When they were predicting the same thing a month ago, two months ago, three months ago. Um, and right now the markets are doing very well. So let me take you through this. One of the best sort of broad, again, broad uh, generalizations that is very reliable and again, I've got about six criteria, but I'm going to give you a couple. So we'll look, let's just say, for example, at the spider, we'll just have a look at the S&P. This can be a similar type of approach. Generally speaking, if we are looking at a weekly time frame, so if we're looking at a weekly time frame, and generally speaking, you'll see here that price is above the red 50 period moving average on the weekly time frame. So it's very important that we choose the weekly time frame. Why? Well, because the daily moves too quickly and it's too choppy. And we can, have an, we can have an uptrend and a downtrend, you know, even in a bear market. The weekly tends to be in an uptrend in a bull market and a downtrend in a bear market, but also it operates above the 50 period moving average. You can see here, it operates above that red 50 period moving average. We are generally in a bull market. Once we start to go below that, we are generally in a bear market. You can see now, not only are we are producing high lows and higher highs, 
we are operating above that 50 period moving average. Okay, so we are back into a bull market and we actually have been for a while. We've actually been in a bull market going back to April. Um, just that a lot of people were too scared to kind of call it that. And we've had a really nice correction. We've come back into these highs. So one of the things the market often does, as, I, as I've sort of said, alluded to earlier, we'll have a level the market will often bump through it, come back, test it and carry on. And that's actually something that's happened exactly here. So beautiful, really nice, took off, just beautiful, 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 beautiful behavior. Boom, came back, corrected and is on its way up to all time highs now. So very, very nice. And we could be at the, potentially be at this beginning of, of, an, of a, a golden age. It's possible. The reason I mentioned this is very important is because the last really big bull run we had was this one here. So from the bottom of COVID, we had this very, very long kind of bull run. That was it. And we always need to have that correction. We need that, we need to come back. We've got to have a correction. So for example, here we had corrections. There's a correction, there's a correction. Then we had a bigger correction. So that was actually, one move and a bigger correction and then another move and a big correction and we had a really long move without a correction and this was our correction and now we're going so a lot of people keep going yeah but we're waiting for the other foot the other shoot to drop part of that's because the media is just thriving on the negativity and the chaos okay um and so here we can see we've had a really good correction this is the most phenomenal correction in relation to that. If we do, if you are into Fibonacci retracements, for example, you can see that that's very much the case. Okay, but the market has had its correction. In case anyone's thinking we haven't had that, we have had it. Okay, so questions come in, and I love it by the way, make this as uh, interactive as possible. So, would I use the 10 and 20 on a lower time frame, such as the one minute and five minute? Believe it or not, yes, I would as a trader. Yes, I would. It works very, very well if I've got a nice established trend. So what I would be looking for, this is a very quick deviation from the topic, but yes, in general, I'm looking for this behavior on any time frame. You'll see that it, it, it works on any time frame. Even here, for example, we could go and have a look at the daily <clears throat> and have a look at the daily now. And you can see that recently here, we've had the same kind of behavior. I'd look for that as well. And that could be pretty much anyway. Gold has been, gold has been going on a four hour. It hasn't even been touching the daily. It's been doing that. Okay. So let me just go back to this. I want to kind of talk about this a little bit more. So generally speaking, if a market, and especially when we look at the S&P, the NASDAQ, um, so just a very quick history lesson, but it's worthwhile. The Dow being the oldest, Charles Dow um, creating it in 1896 because we were an industrial um, civilization at that time. So it was shipping and rail and transport. Um, got listed them all in the Dow. That was the 30th biggest companies at the time. Then, you know, industry really grew. The markets really grew. At the end of World War II, uh, the US was the wealthiest, had possessed 95% of the world's wealth at the end of World War II. Okay, so if you don't really understand, it doesn't even give people an idea of how gargantuan the US economy is. You can be a billionaire just in America alone. You don't even have to sell your products outside America. Whereas if you live in the UK, if you want to become a billionaire, for example, you need to be selling everywhere globally to get to that billionaire status. There just aren't enough people and enough money in the UK to do that. So just understand how gargantuan the US economy is. Um, it's bigger than the next nine economies, next following nine economies combined. It's absolutely gargantuan. And right now, recent data is showing that although China was catching up, the US has now taken off again. And China's economy is 60% is of the size. It's it's dropped to 60% of the size of the US economy. So it's doing doing incredibly well. In fact, even the UK, even the FTSE um, is doing incredibly well. Okay, so if we're looking at our indices, I wanted to have a look at some of these. We'll go through these. Just want to go and see a couple of these that were here. Um, but I'll, um, and I just forget if the, the symbol on this one, I don't think it is necessarily FTSE. I uh, don't, no, 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 I'll go ahead and have a look at it, but that's fine. Emerging markets, we can also have a look at that. No, it's very nice and thin and spotty. Doesn't matter, we'll come back to this. So, um, so broadly speaking, if we're generally, if we're above that 50 period moving average, we're in a bull market. If we're below it, we're in a bear market. So the US, as I said, has 500, you know, medium to large cap companies in the S&P 500. We know them, they're all around the world. So it's a McDonald's and a Starbucks and a Nike and, um, you know, um, they're just absolutely everywhere around the world. So it's a really good sample of the global economy. And then on top of that, the top 100, you know, large cap companies, tech companies are then put into another index in the NASDAQ. So when you look at the Dow, the NASDAQ and the S&P, you do get a really good sense of not just the US economy, but the global economy. So we can get a really good sense of that. And if they're doing really well, 
most of the other economies should be doing well. And then we can just look at the UK, the FTSE, the DAX, which is Germany, which is the biggest one. It's bigger than the FTSE, it's bigger than the UK. Now, when it comes to individual stocks, again, for me, I always tend to have a preference for individual stocks that are performing well. So I would rather go with something that has a general trend to the upside. This is a, so again, I'm not offering financial advice. We're talking, this is a discussion we're having about things that perform well. But one of the things you will see when you look at things that are performing well is you will tend to see that generally speaking, they tend to have a relatively steady kind of direction, the direction which they're going. So this is Visa, for example, you can see it's in a very strong uptrend, going to all time highs. There we go, there's the all time highs. And you know, it's kind of a little bit overextended. So the weekly for me is a really good indicator. If I'm trying to build up my portfolio, I would rather buy when the weekly is in between the moving averages. That way, I don't have to wait seven, eight months necessary to get in on a stock I like. I'll get in hopefully within the next two or three months if I'm gonna add that to my portfolio. And then with regards to kind of stop losses, if now, so again, if I'm if it's share dealing, if I'm owning them, then I might kind of have a pencil marker below these if I'm worried about it kind of um, coming back down below that. Now, we have two choices as human beings when we engage in the markets. We can buy and hold, all right? And don't just take it from me. Take it from Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch. They're saying, look, there's three actions you can take. You can hold, sell, or buy. And in their opinion, you never sold. You never sold. That even if you were panicky enough to buy here, that if you just held it over a long enough period of time, it would come back. Sure, that's absolutely true. But there's also a lot of data that says, look, if we have a strategy that tells us to cut the weakest ones when there is a bear market and then buy again at the lowest point, there are lots of strategies and data that shows you will, you will, um, you know, you'll definitely grow your account because you would have kind of, although you would have taken a little bit of a rinse here, you'd have gained this much when it starts to take off again. So alternatively, in a perfect world, you would just buy more at this point. You wouldn't sell, you would just buy more of your favorite ones as it goes up. So the first thing I want to do here is put your mind at ease. According to the technicals, we are in a bull market now. And we have been in a bear market for, depends on which chart you look at, but we've been in a bear market for long enough. We've had a really decent correction. NASDAQ tech stocks did really well. They've had a very strong correction and managed to come back from that. That even includes like Facebook as well, or Meta. So I'm trying to put your mind at ease that we've, we, we're actually in the early stages of the next bull market. And those bull markets tend to last for several years. So we should, unless something, black swan event occurs, we should be in this bull market for, for years to come. Okay. Let's have a look at Meta. Meta took a hit and they have managed to recover. This is incredible, actually. I'm not just saying that. I thought Meta were done because, you know, most people weren't using it anymore. And I was like on the way down it had just become so spammy and ad driven. And it has, and actually now it's, it's sort of not the worst of the bunch. So now most people are going sort of using it and it provides a lot of good ways to advertise to people. And they seem to be behaving a little bit more sort of more responsibly. So now they've actually managed to recover. That is a phenomenal recovery to come back to. Um, so what I do, and this is a personal preference, I don't use the 200. The 200 works well for people who just want a broad kind of overview. I like the 50. If we're above the 50, we're bullish and bearish. So I use the 50 and price as my equivalent of the 50 and the 200. If 50 drops below the drops and starts moving operating below that, I would see that as a death cross for that particular instrument rather than the 200. Because by the time it's sort of at this point when it crossed, it had actually done most of the moves. So there's too much of a lag um, for that. Part of the reason, as I said, about using simple moving averages was also because all the traders and investors who really kicked off during the 70s and 80s and 90s are now either retired or are running and managing most of the big institutions and funds. And they will tend to impose all the lessons and things they learned in their way of viewing the market down the chain, which means that a lot of traders today are still using old fashioned techniques or what we would think of as old fashioned techniques, but they're just normal techniques, simple moving averages, price. And I think a lot of people overcomplicate it. Okay, so we've got that. Let's have a look at Google, for example. Google's doing well, it's battling with a little bit of a level here. Okay, it's got a little bit of a level, but overall you can see if you look at the general structure looking good, we are producing a series of high lows. The weekly uh, can be very powerful. So one of the things I wanna talk about here very quickly is the RSI and MACD. You can also use stochastics. So I'm just gonna quickly go ahead and just, we don't need that anymore. So let's talk about momentum. This is the way we do it in the city, um, which we consider very reliable. So we do this in the city. So you've got price. 
and price is trending up. It's producing high lows and high highs, which makes it an uptrend. Fine. Now, stocks versus other markets tend to trend almost more than they do anything else. So when you hear about, ah, oh, you know, you might have heard the urban myth that, you know, trending isn't something that happens as often. Trending actually within the stock market is incredibly, um, in incredibly common with most of the best stocks. This is the logic here. The best companies, this is a generalization, but the best companies then look to get listed. So they're already meant to be champions of their class. They get listed and then in theory, if they don't perform over enough time, they could just get delisted. So what's supposed to happen actually on an, on an index as well as a stock exchange, the weaker ones get cold, the best performing ones get added. So over time, they're meant to be made up of winning companies, companies that are generally successful. Of course, and amongst that, are companies that list, um, you know, they get their money out of the IPO and then you find out they're not really worthwhile because maybe they cooked the books to look good or they didn't even just cook the books. They just, maybe the product just wasn't the company failed, for example. So WeWork is, it could be an example of that. I'm not saying it is. I'm just trying to think of a company that got listed, was massive, and then, you know, just suddenly is off the radar or not off the radar, but definitely not, you know, people aren't following it anymore uh, in that sense. Um, and so, the, the, but it's meant to be made up globally of companies that are very good at what they do. And so they would actually tend to be investing. You've got mutual funds and investment funds and retirement funds that put money into the stock market as well. And so it's, it shouldn't be a surprise that it should tend to go up almost more than it goes down. And interest rates, yes, are a bit of a driver. Now I'm gonna be showing my age a bit. I'm, I've just turned 49. Um, but when I was a kid, and even until I was in my 20s, um, which is early 2000, so I was, I probably, uh, in my early 2000, 2004, 2005, you know, I probably turned 30 in 2008. Um, back then, the interest rates were much higher than they, they were more like they are now. And then they had kind of dropped just ahead of the global financial crisis. And that, that was part of what added to the problem. So I think what a lot of central banks and uh, governments are trying to do now is to keep the interest rates higher for longer. They don't really want, they don't want to go back. They don't want to go back to the low interest rates unless they absolutely have to. They really don't want to. They might drop it a little, but I don't think they're going to go back to a, a lifestyle. It's like, it's like having too much credits on a credit card. Um, the markets are doing incredibly well, taking the current interest rates into account. We've had higher interest rates in the past. So actually this shows you that if the interest rates are this high and the markets are, we're in a bull market, that tells you how bullish the market really is. Um, and so actually I would say, cause yeah, that's the case. A lot of people are now predicting a recession and yes, I think people's savings are going to dwindle a bit. So there are some good and bad things. I do think there's a bit of a property bubble. I'm very, this is all personal, by the way, this is not, I'm not speaking for the company. I'm just saying I kind of observe, you know, secondhand cars when they're the same price as brand new cars, then there's a bit of a car bubble. There's definitely a bit of a credit bubble in some areas. I don't think people are as vulnerable with properties and um, and debt as they were in 2008. I think most people have learned from it or just the banks have and most people aren't as exposed. So I don't think we necessarily have a global bubble that's really to pop. I think we have pockets of bubbles. We've got properties too expensive. It's got to kind of come back down, all those kinds of things. And eventually what happens is that will happen when people run out of savings. Um, and also all these subscription services is kind of like death by a thousand expenses. Um, so anyway, there's lots of little things, but I'm not talking about doom and gloom here. I'm saying that, yeah, there are a couple of things that have to correct because they're just a bit too overpriced. And that's that's the free market. That's what happens. So anyway, so we uh, we tend to get that. Um, and there was a reason I want to come. Oh, yes, because we have an uptrend. And so really what happens is that when the market breaks a low, the reason is, is because, you know, every time the market goes back down, buyers come in and push it back up. And so it forms a bit of a base. But when you get to an area like this and the price is now capable of breaking through here, it means that the buyers that were here aren't here anymore. And so now the potential is for the market to possibly produce a lower high and a lower low. When it breaks that low, that's when you start accelerating because once you do that, you're now in a confirmed downtrend. You've gone from a high to a low, lower high, lower low. So that break of that, of this, at least of the new fresh low is quite significant. And often you can get a bit of an acceleration. So the market can panic a bit, and then it can often start to kind of slow down a bit and then it starts breaking and starts going back up. And that's kind of what we've observed here. And the 50 period moving average will do something like this, kind of something like that. So we need to know these high lows and high highs are very important. Um, but also one thing a market can do is it can come back up, it can double bottom and can come back up. And most people forget about that. But a double bottom is a very powerful pattern. It usually is bullish, it's not bearish. So we can get those even though we have a slightly higher low. So support resistance levels and price levels are 
very significant from that perspective. Now, to continue on with the momentum. So what happens is I'm showing you what happens in price, then I'm going to show you what the indicator does. So if price is consolidating, it's going sideways, nothing's happening, and then it bursts out, it goes boom, it'll be very bullish. Then it'll do a small pullback because it's very, very bullish. It's it pent up all this energy, very bullish. Then it goes up very steep. The angle is very steep, very small retracement. Then the angle changes a bit. Okay, then the retracement's a bit deeper. Then the angle changes a bit and the retracement's a bit deeper. And the angle changes a bit, angle's a bit deeper. And so what happens is you have this sort of momentum, angle of momentum, the speed at which it goes. And eventually it starts to lose that momentum. It starts to kind of roll over. This could be a monthly, weekly, daily chart. I'll show you in the chart. You can see it happen. And often you also get a little bit of a break here, and then this starts to kind of go down and you get the shift to the downside. So you get the same sort of thing. And then maybe it actually accelerates, smaller pullback, accelerate pullback, and then it does the same kind of thing. That angle starts to change. So when we look at price, what's actually happening is it gets really excited, moves very quickly, then eventually it starts losing steam, not as many people, it starts to, and it starts to go a bit more sideways, then eventually it can potentially start to go down and accelerates when it, when it becomes clear that it's selling, that it sells aggressively, and then eventually it runs out of sellers. This is pretty, these are standard market cycles in price everywhere, in currencies, commodities, everywhere. It's normal human behavior. So the reason I'm telling this is because there's something to do with the speed at which the market's moving. It's very slow and docile here, then it's very aggressive and excited, and then it starts getting a bit sleepy again. And so when we use an indicator, a momentum indicator, so you can see this in price by eye, as you get more experience, you can see it happening by eye, you don't even need the indicators. But the MACD, RSI, Stochastics, ATR, CCI, Williams Percentile, all of them, basically cousins of each other, what they do is they measure the speed at which the market is moving. So if here I'm looking at price over time, we are looking at the momentum indicators are speed over time. So the momentum indicator does this. This is where it gets really interesting. It's kind of cool. I'm just going to draw a line like this. So what happens is the momentum indicator starts going up because price is going up and it kind of also does high lows, high highs. And then it sort of starts slowing down here and starts going this way. Because what happens is as the market is slowing down, the momentum indicator is going, well, you're moving slower here than you did previously. And so it starts getting left behind. And then eventually when the market has a correction, then the indicator and the market are aligned together. So initially they're aligned which means they're convergent, they're saying the same thing. Then there's a point where we're still getting high highs on price, but the indicators have started to go down and we get what's called divergence. And then the market will potentially have a correction, so the price corrects, and then the market's going down and the price and the momentum indicator is going down and we're back to convergence. So it's only a very, very, very small period of time where we have divergence between it. So although the indicator could is, is traditionally, when it's used traditionally, it's known as a lagging indicator. The way that it's used in the city, it is a leading indicator. Any of them, they're a leading indicator. They are very good, incredibly reliable, like 90, 95% reliable at telling us when a market is getting tired. That doesn't mean we should sell. It's not, a, it's not at all a signal to sell. It's saying maybe you don't want to buy anymore, okay? Or maybe you don't want to sell anymore. So here it's saying to you, you know what, market's slowing down, maybe you don't want to sell anymore. You don't want to buy anymore here, it's running out of steam. You then wait. So the professional traders always wait for price action to change before they then start taking action. So really the most powerful way to use these tools is only when you're worried about a trend running out of steam, because that's your worst fear, is that you finally find a great trend and then it's, it dies on you. <clears throat> so let's see this, <clears throat> excuse me, on the chart. Where's my bra? There it is. So here you can see it, if we just zoom in, you can see if we look, you can see as we go there, oh, actually, you know what, let me just clear this up a little bit. I put two on here. So at TW, uh, at sort of like the way I've learned it, we do, we use two indicators, but mainly so that we have a double confirmation. I don't want to get any false signals. So we've got RSI MACD here. So I've just added them on and then created my own, <clears throat> my own, just my own colors. So it's easy for me to see. So we've got an RSI at the bottom and MACD at the top. And what I want you to observe is that here you can see your higher highs going up. You can see that. But there's a point over here where I've got a higher high. It will just come down and do, we'll do it from about here. You'll notice that we are getting higher highs here. 
and we still technically have a high low at this point. So we've got that bullish divergence, but both the MACD and the RSI are clearly now trending lower. So then what happens? Well, we break our first low over here. We break the first low and then price comes up and touches this level and has another failure. And then we can see it starts to break below that. And when it breaks below that, we're now again convergent. So it's very powerful and it gets even better because it helps us determine when the bear market was coming to an end. So now what's happening, I'm going to change the color here of it. So here we have a bit of a level of support. And actually you can see even here, it's potentially already starting to flatten out, even though we have a lower low and here as well. So already from these lows, whoops, from that low to that low, it's starting to go flat. But again, you want to wait, you want to see it break above these highs, which it does here. So in here, you can see it's starting to trend higher, starting to trend higher. Anyway, breaks above that, it's doing a series of high lows and then eventually it's going to break above this. So if you're patient and you know what to look for, you can see the change as it starts to happen. Very, there's so many little things. It's a lot of things to keep track of if you're new to this, understandably. But after a while, it just becomes like, I always remember that scene in the Matrix at the end of the first movie when Neo just sees numbers. He sees everything just made up of numbers. That's what you, you just start to see the flow of price and you get much more comfortable with it. So let's talk about what's kind of happening over here at the moment. So I'm going to put a line in. Okay. Put a line in. We're battling with resistance here. Yes, generally we're bullish. We're still above the 50 period moving average. So we should still be in a bull market, which means that it's not completely unexpected that at some point we'll break higher. So just let me slow down and explain my logic. We should now be in a bull market. Other, you know, the indices are in a bull market as well. It would be really weird that we go back into a bear market. We've just come out of one. So there's at least a greater than 50% chance the bull market's going to stay, which means that this should ultimately be broken. That's, that's kind of game theory logic. It should work. So um, right now it's batting with a level. And right now you can see kind of those going down a little bit bearish, but actually we've got a high and a higher high and then a lower high. So actually there's not a lot of direction here. So that this doesn't really count for us right now. So really what I'm going to be looking for ultimately will be a break to the upside here. But I wanted to just kind of show you that as we go through these, you can see how generally speaking, it's quite uh, reliable. Okay, and then let's have a look, for example, even on Apple. So how's Apple doing? Again, Apple doing very well here. Here, Apple has broken that trend to the downside. So we've got lower highs and lower lows, and Apple is just breaking that and breaking that and breaking that. Okay, so it's broken this. A little bit higher, it's broken that. So it's at least broken two of them. But also it needs to start its own uptrend. Okay, so from a weekly perspective, I'm certainly going to be looking um, for those. So the MACD and the RSI are incredibly valuable just to really tell me, first of all, that either the trend is established. So right here, for example, you can see the trend is going up and down and up and we could see it's going up and down and up so it's doing the same thing price is doing which means actually it's convergent that's convergent where i really get concerned is if i can see that it's 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 struggling with a level and it's been running for a while and maybe you go up to a higher time frame if you have one like a monthly then you've got a bit of a problem so look at this as well look how we get these pullbacks into the 10 and 20 we go away pull back go away here we've just pulled back and just produced that bullish candle. We've got the 50, uh, 250, 20, and 10 bullish formation. We've just produced a swing on the monthly. So notice the monthly has just had its first retracement and now wants to go. Looks fantastic. Looks really good. It also looks very nice and bullish from that perspective. So that looks really good. Let's talk about NVIDIA because let's talk about it as is, is it overextended. So please observe a couple of things here. I shouldn't say please, I just mean as in. I Again, I love this stuff, I get so excited about this. I want you to also take note of the angle this is at. Look at the angle of that versus the angle of this versus the angle of this. When a market does this, we call that parabolic. It's not a good thing, it's a bubble. This happened to Tesla. It's happened twice to Bitcoin. Okay, when it goes up, when that happens, almost always without fail it comes back to that original trajectory so this 
has gone parabolic. The angle is very high. I wouldn't be entirely surprised. Look, there's a lot of stuff going on with technology at the moment. We could still go higher, but I'm explaining that we're already we're already overvalued. We need a correction. A good correction would have brought us back down to 320 or further would have been a really good correction. So if, for example, you're looking at a video and going, oh, I want to buy now, I want to buy now, I would really struggle. But what I also want to highlight here is the moving averages are coming up to meet it. They are. And when they do that, it'll legitimately probably be able to carry on because then at least it has connected with the moving averages and produced that green candle. So although I'm complaining about the angle of it, it has fulfilled the other technical criteria. Um, but just saying that at some point there will be a deeper correction. I wouldn't panic. It will just bring it back to another key level. So let's go and have a look at it. So on another level, let's have a look at it on a weekly level. And also, please, I also would say that it's also stuck within a range. A little bit hard to possibly identify. I'm trying to see where's my drawing tools. Have I got a drawing tool in here? Rectangle. There we go. Stuck within a range. Isn't always that obvious. It isn't always that obvious, but it actually is. On a monthly, you can see it a little bit clearer. It is stuck within this range. So it's range bound. It's not trending. So here it was trending, here it's ranging. Now there's two things the stock can do to, um, to recharge its batteries after it's been running and running and running. It has two choices. It can have a correction down to the level that I spoke about. Adam. Down to the 320 level that I spoke about, for example, 320 over here, which is these highs over here. I would have liked it to do that before it goes. But the other thing it can do legitimately is tread water. If it consolidates, until price comes up to it, what it's doing is charging its battery. It's basically ranging until the market kind of catches up to it and then it can break out. So that's what's really happening with uh, NVIDIA at the moment. Although we did get some recently get a new high here, we're not trending anymore. So let's just be clear about that. It's not trending. It's range bound now. Okay. Um, but if it does this for long enough, goes into 2024, March, April, May, and breaks out, that to my mind would tick the boxes. Okay, now it's consolidated. I would prefer. A move down and a correction just because I'm used to seeing a market let off some of that steam and you can see it again if you quickly have a look at Tesla so the question has just come in I would say can we cover small cap stocks on future sessions 100% what I will do is I will take your comments and I at the end of the webinar I'm going to give it feedback to uh, up the chain and I will be very specific and I will request uh, a session specifically on small cap stocks just for you okay seriously i'll do that i will pass that on to them and then that can be a session dedicated to just that so let's have a very quick look at tesla let's get, if you want perspective on something then we're going to wrap up but if you want perspective on something let's look at the monthly so here you can see we had a nice little bit of a correction back down to that 50 we stayed above the 50 that's good we're in an uptrend on the monthly now we've produced a bullish candle now whether you, whether, you, whether you like Tesla, most people like Tesla, the company, but some people aren't sure about Elon Musk. I'm going to be neutral here. I have an opinion, but I'm probably going to be neutral here. But for the purposes of tonight, let's just talk about the stock itself. Okay. So here we go. It's in an uptrend. It's produced a bullish candle on the inside. And that's often an indication of the buyers coming in. Now, remember that a stock price can climb, not because necessarily it's a rising tide lifts all boats. So Tesla could be climbing because it's doing well, or it could be climbing because tech stocks are climbing. So I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm not going to express an opinion um, on this. I'm just trying, just in case anyone is getting upset by that, I'm not trying to. I just want to use this as an, as an analysis. So yeah, you can see we are in an uptrend. We have come back to this level. We have uh, identified this level of support. It's a previous level of resistance. You can see it in the next one is actually sitting up here. So the real test for Tesla is going to be if it can break up through that level, break that high. That would really then it would start to accelerate from there. Um, but we can see it has gone from a downtrend into an uptrend on the monthly time frame, which is the slowest one. When we look at it from a weekly perspective, um, although it's technically in a downtrend here, the monthly has already told us what we've seen here is we can see that actually what it's done is a move here and a move here and it's starting to turn around. So we know already that Tesla is probably going to continue up, but it's got to break through that level there. Anyway, okay, so I just wanted to bring in a couple of ones that we know, and uh, I can see already the time has gone. That was so quick. 
just to keep you an eye on that. So ladies and gents, um, first of all, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, yes, I will forward your comments on. Uh, if you do get asked to um, give feedback, feel free to do that. Constructive criticism, I'm okay with that. But I do hope that you found this instructive and useful. And if you do have any questions to do with the platform or to do with your account, please do not hesitate to get in touch with the lovely folks at Capital Markets. All right, you can email them. You've got the client services and the phone numbers here. Um, and again, it was an absolute pleasure. So thank you very much. I'm very excited about the markets at the moment. I'd love to see some stuff that's turning around on the lows. An example, PayPal struggling, but Disney, Walt Disney, Disney, the, the Disney looks fantastic. I should have spent some time on that. So I'll just carry it over to the next webinar and I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. I'm going to end the webinar now and it's going to hoof all of us out. Thank you.